Jenny, hold up. Look, I brought a disc and we could copy this. Okay, no problem. All we gotta do is... Whoa. Don't copy, don't copy that sloppy. Thieving, stealing, taking what's not yours. Is that really where you want your life to go? But they can't stop people from copying, it's too easy. It might be easy, but it's still against the law. Don't copy, don't copy that sloppy. Around the mid-2000s, post-Napster, music piracy was still a huge problem. At the time, it was all torrents. Everybody had moved to torrents. That's how most people were, sort of young people at least, were getting their music. Online piracy is costing the U.S. film industry $20 billion a year. Like, don't they know they can download that stuff for free? Use BitTorrent. The question is, what's the best way to fight the RIAA? Hack of them, 98%. Shame on you people. The music industry was preoccupied with the whole peer-to-peer -peer file transfer, illegal theft. It had to figure out how it was going to attack and approach the marketplace in this new world to be able to remain viable and competitive. To us, it's black and white. Either you pay for it or you don't. Straight up and down is stealing. Sweden, out of all the countries in the world, had adopted pirate technology more than anywhere else. It was a country full of hackers. They'd come up with all different kind of takes on peer-to-peer -peer networks and BitTorrent, and they had the pirate party. An entire political party that really traces its roots back to Napster. For them, trading music, it's like a political, cultural calling. The Swedish parts of the music industry, they were suffering even more than maybe their American counterparts. Very few people were, were buying CDs anymore, or very few people were buying licensed material online. Everyone was using the file sharing networks. At that time, there was a guy named Daniel Ek, who was Swedish, who had previously been the CEO of a torrent company. And he said, I have a plan to make people pay for music again. We're gonna move beyond the locally stored MP3 file into the kind of like globally distributed stream. That was his business model, which he calls Spotify. What if instead of you know, having to go through the trouble of you know, buying and downloading music, what if they could had access to all the music in the world? Just through a streaming service. Spotify launched in Sweden in October 2008. Spotify took off in Sweden, and so Eck was able to go around to different countries and get, and get the labels there to do the same thing, and eventually he came to the US. Daniel's, I mean, he's not Steve Jobs. He's very soft-spoken. You can tell that he's kind of a, a nerdy engineer. He's very polite and, and easygoing and for the labels. I think Daniel being not as abrasive and scary and powerful as Steve Jobs was probably pretty attractive. And the thought of him sitting in a room with all these music execs and, and banging his fist on the table is hard for me to imagine. But he's the one who talks all of these labels into cooperating and giving this service that he made a chance. Spotify, they presented us with an option. Now, we could say we don't want to use it, we don't want to distribute it that way, but we'll be like dinosaurs and we wouldn't be here. The mistakes the major record labels made in the late 90s, I will give them credit for this. They learned from those mistakes and they 
understood that they had to scramble to get ahead of the next wave of technology. Europe's best kept secret is out in the open. Spotify has landed in the USA. And with 10 million registered users in Europe, it could be a big hit here. The unlimited service is ad free, but locked to your computer, while the premium service brings Spotify to your mobile devices. You're like, hey, you want to hear this new song? All you have to do is go, boom, it's right there. Wait a minute, everything's here? Like everything? Just like the first time I used an MP3, I said, oh my God, I'm never going to pay again. The first time I used Spotify, I was like, I'm going to pay again, aren't I? And so that's how well it worked. From about the turn of the century until three or four years ago, the music industry had lost around 40% of its entire value. Physical sales are pretty much over, but streaming's growing, growing, growing. Next thing you know, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, they all want to have a streaming subscription service. Good morning. Today we're announcing Apple Music. Today I'm happy to announce Google Play Music All Access. Amazon is taking the plunge, diving into an already crowded streaming market with a new subscription music service. Some big names behind a streaming music service being relaunched now with some help from Jay-Z. He bought Tidal for $56 million in January. We've reached a point where there are too many streaming options to mention. Companies ran away from music because there wasn't any growth, now there is. That's a sign that the industry is becoming healthy you know, after years of being you know, really sick. It's just a question of what it means for artists. For Microsoft, Google, Apple, music doesn't mean something special to them. It's just something that gets bundled along in this monthly fee that you pay for various things, whereas obviously this is the lifeblood for musicians. Streaming has a lot of business challenges attached to it. The whole notion of micro pennies. You could have hundreds of thousands of streams and you get paid 12 cents. People can't even tell me what a stream is worth. This just changes from month to month to month to month to month. No one knows how to quantify As far as online streaming, the record companies, they take whatever their percentage is. Everyone gets a cut. What's left of that, we have to split four ways and with our manager. So it's literally nothing, you know? The artists are looking at these tenth of a cent royalties and going, that's crazy. Do you know how many times I'm going to have to listen to that song or those groups of songs to be equivalent to what I'd make from an album sale? Tonight, word of a music smackdown. Taylor Swift is pulling her music off of Spotify and all of this over pricing. In an editorial, she wrote, file sharing and streaming have shrunk the numbers of paid album sales drastically. Valuable things should be paid for. That's all like, what Taylor Swift just did, and I think that's awesome. I mean. The only person really getting screwed here is the artist, and that's the way it always is. Why don't they pay Taylor Swift more? Why don't they pay Ari the Rugged Man more? Taylor don't need the money as much as me, but she's got a good point. Everybody's doing the work, then they need to get paid. It's just that simple. I need my money. So you had some artists speaking out. Rihanna released a new single last week. She's one of the partners of Tidal. You can't stream it on Spotify, but you can stream it exclusively on Tidal. In reality, they're all coming back. The other week, Taylor Swift decided to once again offer her entire back catalog on Spotify. With streaming, it's the way that the music industry is going, so we're all going to have to figure out a way to make it work. When people are bitching they're not making enough money, they have to understand if you're a successful artist today, you can make more money than you've ever made in the history of the music business. There are sponsorships, and you can do ads. In addition, concert revenues exceed by a huge margin what they used to. So you have to look at all the opportunities, not only from these streaming services. Yeah, you get pennies on the dollar, whatever. Who cares? Go out there and play a show and make money and get out there and do that. Don't complain about an internet streaming service. That's so lame. Cry me a river. Through this entire period of time, while the recorded music industry's been down, the live music industry's been flourishing. And there's maybe an easy explanation. In a world where we get less and less personal online, the precious thing is seeing it live and experiencing it, because you can't digitize experience. The digital age makes it a lot easier to scout talent, I would say. 
we're able to get data and metrics from all sorts of different sites, um, whether that's Spotify listener data on the publicly available about the artist page. There's usually about 40% we see of their monthly listeners in a certain city would actually purchase tickets to that show in that city. I think now your recording is an advertisement for your performance and your live engagement, not the other way around. Touring. Touring is nonstop revenue all year. That's where all the money comes from. I'll tour till I'm dead. I'll tour till I'm dead. It shouldn't be that you have to be a touring act. Touring is grueling. We don't want to tour all the time. You know, it's, we're getting older and it's a lot of hard work being out there doing that. But those are things you have to do. I think I make the most of my, the majority of my money from shows. It wasn't always like that, but it's like that now. Merch is probably next. I didn't think I'd be a t-shirt merchant when I was started making music. These are socks. These go really quickly, especially at shows. So this is a raincoat. It has the hot sugar castle. I have shirts, I have Afro hoodies. I have this Afro shirt right here. This is a t-shirt, another t-shirt with another picture of me. You cannot, to my knowledge, download a shirt. This is a front and back hat. This is Bahala Java. It's a brand of coffee that Zach Wild created. I'm telling you, you can clean your house about five times, mow the lawn three times, even though it's already finished the first time you mow it, and that's before brunch. <laughs> and it is one of the best-selling coffees on Amazon. You have to, as an artist, make products that are sellable, because music is not as sellable as it used to be. Where records had always been by far the majority of the income earned by people who made albums, Increasingly, artists were making more money from touring, from live events and ticketing and merchandising and meals, and they really were earning from their records. Our revenue model didn't make any sense any longer. Let me ask you something. Are y'all gonna have some fun tonight? I was offered really deals in my life. And it got to the point where I hated my label. So I said, hey, I'm gonna run and do this myself. And when I started doing independent records, that's when all my money started coming in. And that's where all my success started coming in. And that's where all of my fans started coming in. Chance the Rapper has gone from making mixtapes in his South South Chicago home to winning three Grammys and performing for the president at the White House all without the backing of a single record label. More artists have been making more music at home and releasing it themselves in, into streaming services. So it's, a, it's been a creative renaissance. We're now going to be rolling out the ability to monetize directly on SoundCloud. We're inviting hundreds of thousands of creators. This means more money in their pocket at the end of the day uh, on a revenue share basis. Thousands of people are making money off their talents and hobbies with Patreon. Patreon is a lot like Kickstarter, but it's ongoing, so it's per music video I upload. Bandcamp is this website where artists can independently just take the music that they produce themselves and put it up onto the website. An artist uploads their music to Bandcamp, uh, a fan pays them directly for it, we take a small cut, it's about half of what uh, iTunes uh, charges. Bandcamp has become the hero. I think that they are more closely attuned to listening to the needs of musicians and actually meeting those concrete needs it's better than, I think, virtually any other company that's out there. They've really provided an online record store and a way for artists to recoup money, and I haven't seen any other company try to meet those needs. If you've got merchandise, if you've got physical CDs, if you've got t-shirts and hats and all sorts of stuff like that, you can sell that directly on the Bandcamp platform as well. Can't do that on Spotify or Apple Music. Now to another grim milestone, the world surpassing one million deaths from the coronavirus.
I don't think we were prepared for the realization that the majority of our livelihood depended on us being on the road all the time and physically being at shows. Most artists today who are successful are making the majority of their income through live performance. 60, 70, sometimes upwards of 80% of an artist's income is reliant on touring, on merchandise, on, on this, which is empty. <laughs> A little more than a month before they're scheduled to be in California, Variety reports BTS canceled shows in Seoul, Korea due to fear over the spread of the virus. More than 40% of Canadians wouldn't feel comfortable going to a music event until at least six months after social restrictions are lifted. The shutdown of live shows this year has affected me in so many different ways. I have been turning to live streaming. I'm on Twitch every week. I've built up a nice little community. I've got a Discord going. I'm doing the whole thing. Woo! Let go, let go. <gasps> Look, we about to get it bracken in this <laughs> You just tuned into the littest channel on Twitch. In a major collaboration that's clearly a sign of times, 12 million players locked into Fortnite last night to watch a virtual Travis Scott perform in concert. It's great for the artists, it's great for the fans, and that's something I think that you're going to see more of after the pandemic, is people not wanting to just see a show at a venue in a theater. And you'll want to see more and more experiences and less and less just pure concerts. Everybody on YouTube, subscribe. Twitch, you subscribe. Facebook, do you like and subscribe too? Let's go! Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you smash the subscribe button on YouTube. Thank you guys for donating. Even if you didn't have the means to donate, thank you for tuning in. I've had a music career just by going straight to consumers and to an audience and fans, rather than waiting for this faceless music industry guy to help pitch it. You didn't do nothing. I did all the hard work, so why shouldn't I make 100% of that money? What's up, guys? Hi, guys. Welcome back to the channel. Zoom in. I want to see you. I got my screen right up here. I can watch you guys. Interaction is everything for me. Something that's really unique with live streaming is that you actually get to know the names of your fans and you get to know their, their personal lives. Big hearts up for Big Cheese right now. Cause he needs our love, man. He was he was down for a little second. Dude, shout out Savannah Bebo, Sparky, Miss Winter Falcon. You guys are legends. Legends. Your fans get to actually chat with you live and give input as far as what they want to hear. So the revolution will be televised after that. <laughs> but there really is nothing like being on stage with tens of thousands of people in front of you at a festival with the lights and everybody screaming. I just miss it all. I don't think streaming is the end of the game. I think the game will continue to unfold. You, as a, as a talented artist, you can go make your own recording. You can build your career using social media. And the major labels role in creating the next generation of successful artists will become less and less important. We found out that the record companies are limited. It's like, okay, you're taking, but what you giving back? You giving me a piece of my soul back to me? Or you just taking my soul and keeping it and cashing it in? If you've only got a niche audience, it doesn't make sense to sign to a major label. Right now, more than ever, the law of a thousand true fans is what we're going to see working as a model going forward. You could have 10 million plays on your song on Spotify, but that doesn't mean that you're gonna sell 100 tickets to a show. 
1,000 true fans can sustain you if you have the right platforms in place. And that can be anything from Bandcamp to Patreon to Twitch, any of these places that are meant to build community and allow you to have a space that you control where you can sell virtually anything about your creative process that you want. Most people who aren't on a major label want to be. A lot of the DIY guys, once they start to kind of, you know, blow up, they go to the label. The Weeknd is a perfect example. He did these kind of brilliant albums in his bedroom. They got massive radio play after he gave them away for free. But then he went to the major label when the time came. Labels definitely have a place but they're not the gatekeepers anymore. You don't have to sign to a major record label to be successful in the music business anymore, you know, and thank God for that. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. The MP3 is now an obsolete technology. By 1998, there were more sophisticated replacements available. But the core of what it did lives on. Whenever you're streaming music via your phone, it's using the same techniques that Brandenburg pioneered back in the 80s. People are walking around with their internet connected phones, and they're just listening to music all the time. And it couldn't be easier. So finally, we have this thing that everybody's been talking about literally for you know, 20 years, the Celestial Jukebox. And people are listening to more music than they ever have in history. If you go to the roots of the mobile computing revolution, it's based on MP3 piracy. The idea of walking into an Apple store and spending three or $400 on a gadget you had to get primed by the MP3 to want to do that. I got two! Ultimately, I think the MP3 created more value than it destroyed. Yesterday, Apple reported the largest quarterly profit of any public company in history. A lot of money was made along the way, just not by the people who used to make it. The fundamental way that companies make money has completely changed the first time an MP3 was moved from one person to the next. Generations from that point forward have realized access to things is more valuable than owning them. Why own a car when I can call Uber anytime? Why own a second home when I can go to Airbnb? If I can have access and hear any song when I want, why own a CD? The march of technology is a good thing, not a bad thing. The fact that it uniquely affected us was the way of life, really. Nowadays, I love to listen to classical music. I love some of the newer music. What about rap music? Oh, yeah, why not? Talking about MP3, I had the feeling this is not good for the music industry. But in the end, I think it changed for the better. <laughs> 